next song is number 207. Number 207. Good morning. You know, if I told you, I started to pick one up, but I didn't. If I, I told you I had a rock that would aptly describe that I had a rock, but it wouldn't tell you much about it. Is it smooth or is it jagged? Is it one color? Is it multicolored? Is it soft like sandstone or is it hard like granite? You know, there's different things about that. There's different facets, so to speak, about that that explain to us exactly what kind of rock that is. Rock is an apt uh, term for it, <clears throat> but it doesn't always tell us everything that we need to know. <clears throat> In the same way, words from another language sometimes can be difficult to translate or won't always tell us exactly what we need to know when they get translated. You know, in the, in the Greek, there are eight different words for the word love. We have one. And so sometimes there's nuances that can be missed. You know, remember Jesus told Peter, Peter, do you agape owe me? And Peter replied, yes, Lord, I phileo you. We lose that because we have simply one word. And it gets translated, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. So sometimes it, it, it kind of loses some of the things that we, we uh, some of the intent behind it. Sometimes it is simply because there are multiple words that can be translated one way, and there's multiple words that can be translated another way. For example, I might say, I went to the bank and I bought a, I got some money and I bought a, a fishing pole, and I went and sat on the bank of a river. But in German, that would mean I went to the bank and sat on the ufer of the river. You couldn't do a word-for-word -word translation. There is no word-for-word -word translation of the Bible. It would be, it, it's, it's impossible because of the things that we've, we've talked about thus far. And sometimes translators, they try to translate as best they can. You know, there's different, uh, the, the sentence structures are different, the punctuation is different. There's different things like that. There's different words like that. Sometimes there's words that can be translated and one word equivalent. Sometimes it takes multiple words to translate uh, another one, and vice versa when you go back and forth. And, and translators, sometimes they, they, they will try to translate more literally, and that makes it a little bit more difficult to read, and sometimes they translate more meaning, me, meaningful. But when they do, uh, sometimes they get to two meaning, and then they put their own meanings in. And so it's, when you look at that kind of thing, it becomes a little difficult. <clears throat> I'm of the opinion, though, that one of the words that seems to get a little bit lost in translation is this word, faith. Now, we look at it and we think, I know what faith means. And we do. We know what faith means to us in our modern English language. But what does faith mean as far as a biblical term? And so, <clears throat> might help if I actually turned it on. <clears throat> Ephesians 2, 8, for, grace you, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. <clears throat> now that is, an ex is, is a truth. For by grace you have been saved through faith. But many people don't really understand what faith is here and what it really means. Because we have, um, we have put our modern interpretation of what faith is. And many times, faith for a lot of people is a mental assent. And that's it. Well, I have faith that there's a God. Well, I have faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It's a mental assent. And that's all that it is. And therefore, if that is your interpretation of this particular word that is translated faith, 
then you don't really have an understanding of what this means. It is not a mental ascent that part of our grace should be saved through a mental ascent of God or Jesus Christ. It is means a whole lot more than that. It has a lot more meaning than that. In fact, that really isn't the meaning of it at all. So let's kind of start back in the Old Testament. Because how did the Old Testament uh, translate? Well, in Genesis, the 15th chapter, you remember this. Abraham was brought outside, and God told him to look toward heaven and number the stars if you were able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring both be. And he, Abraham, believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Now, what does this word believed, what is that, what, what did that mean? In the Hebrew, that particular word is amon. And it is translated as faith, as we, you know, consider believe. Sure, trust, established, firm, trustworthy, confirmed, reliable. These words here, okay, carry with it a much stronger meaning. Listen to that. Sure, trust, established, firm, trustworthy. Now, there is, in the scripture we just read in Genesis 15, uh, chapter 6, verse there, it says he believed God and he counted him as righteousness. That belief, Amon, has this little, what's called a hippo stem. Now, I, I'm telling you a whole lot more than I know here, okay? This is, you read this stuff. And it is attached to that, okay? And so, it is on the very end of that, since Hebrews read from right to left. This stem, it says, is a causative. And it means to cause, to be certain, sure, to be certain about, to be assured. He believed God. He was assured. That's a little bit different, isn't it? He was assured. Now listen to what this, the uh, TWOT says. In this sense, the word in the hippo conjugation is the biblical word for to believe. And it shows that the biblical faith is an assurance, a certainty, in contrast with modern concepts of faith of something possible, hopefully true, but not certain. So when he believed God, he was certain about it. He was sure. He was assured that God would come through. This, this hippo stem, I don't want to be off on this, but, you know, apparently Microsoft Word's a lot smarter, smarter than me, okay? He was read from right to left, and we read from left to right. In order for me to get this little, little symbol here that you could see what this was, I had to take it apart from other Hebrew letters and so when I put my cursor on it and hit delete, it deleted that way. I had a tough time getting that one little little thing there for you. But this is a little this is different than our modern concept of faith. And so he believed the Lord. It wasn't a mental sense. It wasn't a hopefully that it's true. It was an assurity. Now we <laughs> The other conjugation of that is, is amen. We know that word. But what does it mean? What does it mean in the Hebrew? Amen. Surely it is true. A strong affirmation of what is declared. Acceptance clearly implied. Sometimes double for emphasis. The various derivatives reflect the same concepts of certainty and dependability. The derivative amen, verily, or truth. Is carried over in the New Testament. You remember Jesus would say, sometimes this is translated verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say to you. That's amen, amen. And of course, we've carried it over in our English language. The end of a, a, a prayer would say, amen. Surely it is true. But it certainly isn't the concept of I hope that it is true. That I think maybe it might be true. 
It is a certainty. And so, again, this is uh, kind of get to uh, the idea of amon and amen. Amon, what that means and how it is. Sometimes, again, we talk about translations, and there's a little wordplay going on in the Old Testament. But again, sometimes we miss because we just simply don't have the the, the words translate. In Second Chronicles, the twenty chapter, he says, "Hear me, Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe His prophets." And you will succeed. Now, this word believe in the Lord is a month. This word established is a month. Now, remember as we went, I'll go backwards here real quick. Um, a month means to be believe, sure, trust, established. Confirmed. Confirmed. Okay? So, you go over here, and then this is what the the, the uh, translators, of course, have tried to determine, because it's Amon and Amon. And so this is believe in the Lord, and you will be established. Well, both believe and establish in the same Hebrew word. Isaiah 7, 9 has the same word play. It says, if you are not firm in the faith, you will not be firm at all. Firm there is Amon. And of course, the second one is Amon. So translators do it a little bit differently. In the New American Standard, if you will not believe, you will surely not last. They're trying to get across a meaning because it's the same Hebrew word. But understand that when he says believe, it also means firm, it means established, it means lasting. KJV, if you will not believe, surely you will not be established. Those things are firm words, established. You're established on something. You stand firm. It is a surety. It is a confirmation. That is what the Amon means. NIV. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. They're trying to get across the idea of being established, being firm, being confident. That's the, the word. So, one of the things we, we learn from Amon is obedience is the outcome of that. Now, we're spending a lot of time in the Old Testament here, but we'll move, move forward to the new here in a few minutes. In Deuteronomy 9, chapter 23rd verse, the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea, saying, Go up and take possession of the land that I've given you. Then you rebelled against the commandment of the Lord and did not believe him or obey him. Again, the belief here is a mom. But his expectation is obedience. If you believe, obedience should follow. If you are sure about God, obedience should follow. 2 Kings, the 17th chapter. <clears throat> he says there, The Lord warned Israel and Judah by every prophet and every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes in accordance with all the law that I have commanded your fathers and that I sent to you by the, my servants, the prophets. But they would not listen, but were stubborn as their fathers had been who did not believe in the Lord their God. There is an exact equation here between belief and obedience. He says, they were stubborn. He says, I, I, um, you turn from me evil ways, you keep my commandments and my statutes. But they would not listen, they were stubborn, uh, stubborn and did not believe. They didn't obey. So, one more here. He's, this doesn't have the word Amon in it. But if you love the Lord your God, again, the idea is obedience follows. He says, you shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way. And when you lie down. And when you rise. 
You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and you they shall be as a frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. You are to do something. If you love God, which means you believe Him, you are to do something. So, that's the idea in the Old Testament. Amon. That was the word that was used, and as we saw there, it means to be sure, it means to be established, it means to be true, it means to be um, <clears throat> trusting. All of those things are a part of that. So, in the New Testament, Romans 4.3, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, the same scripture that we just talked about. So, what did Paul, when he wrote this down, in classical Greek language, what did he choose to use? He choose, chose to use a, 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 a verb there that is pistule. We'll kind of talk about that in the, a little bit uh, previously. But he says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So why did he choose to use this particular Greek word? In fact, the Septuagint uses the same Greek word. The Septuagint translates <clears throat> virtually um, all, every time you see a mon in the Old Testament, Septuagint, which was translated into Greek, uh, uh, they use the term pistuo. Well, why did they choose that? There are other terms. There are other terms for belief, but why did they choose to use that one? Because it has basically the same meaning in the Greek that the, that the Hebrew does. So Paul says, Abraham pistuo God, and it's counted him as righteousness. Got ahead of myself, didn't I? Well, one of the facets of faith is trust. And Greek usage, and I'm not going to go through all this, you can see that um, uh, the there, which is the verb, okay? Um, uh, pistos, which is, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, is the, the, the noun, and then you've got, you know, uh, uh, not trustworthy or whatever. But these words here, if you look at this, this is classical Greek usage for it. And when you look at these, you have to kind of ask yourself, is this what I think when I read the term faith or belief in the New Testament? <laughs> this jewel means to trust, also to obey. It can mean, again, to believe, and in the past, to enjoy confidence. Again, the noun verb form means to be trusting. Also with the nuance of obedient, trustworthy, faithful, reliable. That's what it means. And, and we talked about that, you know, the Apostle John, when he wrote his epistles, he used the term pistuoize, believe in. He used it 37 times more than every other writer. And, it, and it, again, it just emphasizes the idea of trust. You believe in something, you trust that. You remember in, in Matt, uh, at Mark, the uh, fifth chapter, the story of the story of the of Jairus' daughter, and he goes on to meet Jesus. And, then, and when he gets there, his servants arrive and say, don't bother the master, the daughter's not dead. And what does Jesus say to him? He says, don't be afraid, just believe. Now what? That is pistuo. What? What is he saying to him? Is he saying to him, Jairus, don't be afraid. Just have a mental assent. You know? Just just hope. Just maybe. You know? Is that what he's saying? No, he's saying, trust me. 
Trust God. That is what he was trying to tell them. So when we look at this, we want to keep these things in mind. What it means when it says believe or it says to have faith. So when we, we look at, at, at Ephesians there, that's a different concept. You're for saved by grace through faith. You're saved by grace through pistos, which means trusting, which means obedient, which means faithful, which means reliable. Those are the meanings. So our concept, our modern concept of faith, and we use it all the time, okay? You know? <clears throat> and, I, and it creeps over, and even in my mind, it creeps over into the biblical concept of faith. Now, this past year was a little difficult for those of us that were sooner fans. <laughs> and, you know, you would, we were, <laughs> you were playing bad teams and we're losing. And people would say, you just have faith. What we're saying is when you say have faith, you're saying, just hope. Maybe, maybe at the end of the game we'll pull it out, maybe. But we're not saying is this team is really good, so you just be positive. You be certain. That's not what we're saying. <clears throat> so we weren't certain about it, but we would use that term. But the biblical term is to be certain, is to be sure, is to be positive, is to be established, is to be firm. So in Luke, the 16th chapter, 11th verse, says, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous, in the unrighteous with, who will entrust the stuo, you, uh, to you, the true riches? We just don't have, I couldn't go out there and find a bunch of verses that translates as faith as trust. Okay? The implication is there. That's what it means. But the, the translators just simply don't translate it that, that way. But that is the, 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 the term. That is the classical Greek term. Now, in Romans, the fourth chapter and 20th verse, it says, No unbelief made him promise. Now, this is talking about Abraham. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. Listen to that. That is a, a pistos, which is unbelief. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That's what our faith should be. That's what it talks about. We should be fully convinced. That's what Abraham's was when he says he believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. He was fully convinced. So, that's what ours should be. He didn't, his, he didn't have any unbelief. He was fully convinced. Now, faith is believing. We know that, that you know, we have faith as trust. That's one facet. We have faith as believing. I mean, that's, that's the way it can be translated. And so we have, therefore, that it says, like here in John, the second chapter, 22nd verse, when therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. But again, it's not just simply a, a mental ascent. They believed in it. They believed the scripture. Now when you use it in that sense, what we're saying is I fully accept what it's saying. This is true. Just like the, uh, the conjugation of amen, amen, meaning truly, truly. I believe this is true. And that's what faith as belief is, is it is true. We have faith as trust, but we also have faith as belief, meaning it is true. And they believe the scripture, understanding that it was true. In Acts 24, verse 14, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the wall and written in the prophets. 
that is true. I believe that what the Quran and prophets say is true. It's not a doubt. It's not a waiver. It is true. John 5, 46, if you believed Moses, if you would have believed what Moses said was true, okay, you would know what I'm saying is true. If you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? If you do not trust what he wrote, you're not going to trust what I have to say. If you do not uh, understand that what Moses wrote was true, you're not going to understand what I say is true. That is pistu or pistus as believing. But again, it's the idea of accepting it as true. So, faith is obedience. This is another facet of it. Remember the classical Greek that we we put up there. I'm going to go back there. But remember one of the one of the things that it said there was Pistuo was trusting obedience. Now see that's a that's a facet that most people, modern people, will never put with the idea of faith when they read in the Bible, when they talk about something, you know, believing, or the idea of faith, or certainly when it comes to Ephesians, the second chapter and eighth verses, we started out with that for by grace you are saved through faith. They won't attach obedience to it. And when we read, we should attach that facet to it. He says here in Romans, the first chapter and eighth verse, first thank God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. Well, okay. But he says later in the 16th chapter and ninth verse, for your obedience is known to all so that I rejoice over you, but I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as what is evil. He says your faith is known to proclaim throughout the world. How would that be known? A mental ascent is not known to anybody. I have a mental ascent, and you're not going to know anything about it. He says their faith is known throughout, proclaimed throughout the, all the world. How is it known? He says your obedience is known. Paul uses the gospel call, the charisma, equating it with obedience. Listen to this. In Romans, the 15th chapter, 18th verse, For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience. What? He wants to bring the Gentiles to obedience. When he goes out and... Uh, uses, I use the term charisma here, that's... But it's the gospel call. We think, and, and rightfully so, that we want to bring people to faith. And we do. Part of that concept is obedience. He said, I want to bring the Gentiles to obedience. Obedience is a part of it. He goes on to say, in Galatians 5, 5th chapter 7, the first, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth. We talk about faith, living by faith. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute here. Living by faith. He says you need to obey the truth. He actually substitutes Isaiah's believed with obeyed. In Romans, the 10th chapter, 16th verse, he says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what we have heard, heard from us? So faith has an aspect of obedience. And you see here that he, he utilizes that in support of what he's saying here about obeying the gospel, what Isaiah says about believing. What was the first chapter, verses 5 and 6, it says, Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. What facet of faith are we talking about here? It's the obedience piece of it. Obedience of faith. We have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. 
for the sake of his name among the nations, including you who are to be called, uh, Jesus, uh, who uh, are called and belong to Jesus Christ. Remember he said there earlier he wants to bring the Gentiles to obedience. And he says here, I want to bring about the obedience of faith. <coughs> we don't often equate that facet with faith. And again, it's because I think, my personal opinion here, that our modern concept of faith doesn't always jive with the biblical concept of faith. Now, I'm not going to go through Hebrews 11th chapter, but you can see over and over again here that by faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice. He obeyed. By faith, Noah constructed an ark. He obeyed. By faith, Abraham obeyed. Okay. By faith, Sarah considered him faithful. Obeyed. By faith, Isaac blessed. He obeyed. By faith, Moses refused. He obeyed. You know, Hebrews 11, chapter, first verse, when, uh, when we enter into that faith hall of fame, it gives a definition and it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. That is the biblical concept of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. We understand that. We know what evidence is. We can look at something and go, we know what happened. You know, it's probably not a really good example, but I'm coming up with this on the top of my head here. There is a wallet left in a room. There's no windows. There's only one door. Only one person has gone in and come out, and the wallet's gone. Who took the wallet? Well, duh. Okay. We know who took the wallet, but did we see them? No. But all of the evidence says this took place. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things we don't see. Okay. I did have that up there. Wow. Yes, he says the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Why can't it be better in that sense? Faith as faithfulness. That is one of the, the uh, 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 translations of the word Yeshua. In 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, in seventh chapter, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith as faith. A facet of faith is faithfulness, remaining steadfast, remaining established and sure. He says, I have kept the faith. In Revelation, the second chapter, the 13th verse, he says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name. And you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful pistos, witness who was killed among you. He was faithful. He remained faithful. I don't want to get ahead of myself here. Faith as faithfulness. 2 Timothy, the second chapter, verse 12. If we endure, what is he talking about here? You know, it's one of the things when we are, uh, become Christians, we have to continue. If we endure, and there's things that we have to endure as Christians. But if we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Now listen to what he's saying. If we endure, we will reign with him. And then, if we deny him, he will deny us. And then he goes on and kind of puts it in the terms of faith. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. What happens? If you are faithful... You endure. You're established. You're sure. If, and he says, God always remains faithful. If we fall and we step away and we don't endure, continue on, we become faithless. But that doesn't have an effect on God. God's always faithful. Anyway, 2 Timothy, 
Oh, wait a second. Put it down there twice. Okay, Romans. What if some were unfaithful? Apostas. Does their faithlessness nullify the faithlessness of God? Again, it just it we're just emphasizing the fact that that this term of faith carries with it the idea of of, of pistol, or pistos, carries with the idea of being faithful. So we have the facets of being of being trust. We have the facet of being, of being obedient. We have the facet of it being faithful. But faith, in the Bible sense, those facets that we're talking about here have another facet to it. And that facet is, is that it is not a static affair. Now I want you to grasp that for just a moment. It is not a static affair. And what I mean by that is that you just don't go, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and I'm going to go live my life in any way I want to. I'll do what I want to, and God, if you're a good idea, you can follow me. That's not what faith is. It is not a static affair. It is something that must be maintained against the danger of falling. The modern concept is that faith is simply an acceptance of the gospel call. That's it. And so let's go back to uh, uh, Ephesians again where it says that we are saved by grace through faith. And what many do is they say that is the moment you believe. That's it. That's what that's talking about. No, it's not. It's talking about the fact that our salvation is dependent upon us maintaining it. Paul said that I have kept the faith. If he had not kept the faith, he would not be saved. The, and so faith is a way of life and it must be, listen to this it must be nurtured it must be edified it must be protected and it must be expanded so when we talk about faith and having faith and being sure and trusting and being faithful we're talking about living a life of those facets. Galatians 3.11, he says, Now it is evident that no one is justified by God uh, before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. That's how we're supposed to live. It is, again, it's to be nurtured, edified, protected, expanded. Romans 1.17 for in it, the, uh, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And he, and he just simply repeats it uh, twice there. Romans 11, 20. This, that is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. He said they believed at one time. They were broken off. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. Stand fast for your faith. I, I don't want to get off here, running out, out of time a little bit. It says, so do not become proud of the fear. I found this very interesting. <clears throat> he says there that basically you're to believe, you're to stand in your faith, but fear. In the Old Testament, Man's relationship to God is characterized by faith and fear. Almost equally. Somebody that looked it up, I certainly didn't do this, said that basically both are used in relationship to God approximately 150 times. So, isn't that kind of a, an interesting concept? And I don't want to get off on it. You can probably make a little lesson on that. But we are to believe, we're to trust God. We're to be established with Him. We're to be sure. We're to have 
our belief and trust in Him. But we're to fear. We're to fear. Now we have to trust God, but we have to fear Him. We have to, and, and Jesus tells us, fear Him. Does that destroy both the body and soul? Side note. Okay. 1 Thessalonians 3.10 That's we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see your, you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Remember we talked about faith has got to be expanded. When you come and you look <clears throat> and, and you, you first come to Christ hear, believe, repent, confess and you're baptized in the watery grave of of baptism and you come to him you're to have a surety you're to have a confidence but there is more you are to expand that faith and the Bible uses the concept, we're not going to go back and and, and quote him, but the Bible uses the concept of being children or babes in Christ but you don't remain there we're to expand that faith. He said, I'm going to supply the Thessalonians. He said, I'm going to supply what is lacking in your faith. They were lacking things in their faith. Yes. They didn't have all the knowledge that they needed to have. Second Corinthians, the 10th chapter, 15 verse. We do not boast beyond the limit in the labors of others, but our hope is that as your faith increases... Our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged. Your faith should be increasing. As we go through our life, our faith, our surety, our trust, our faithfulness should be increasing. It is not a static affair. Faith is one of those things that... It's a word that we use all the time... It's a word that we have an understanding in our vernacular. But sometimes we have to kind of go a little deeper. And faith is one of those words that I fear, and I'll say in my opinion, that the world has taken and applied a modern Western version of it to what the Bible says. It's not that the fact, I mean, it's not that, that this translation of the steel is faith or believing or belief is wrong. It's about the only thing that we can put in there. It's about the best that we can do in terms of translating. But we have to understand what did the Bible writers mean? And I believe that they meant all of the facets of faith as they understood it and not necessarily the modern version that we have. Yes, we are saved by grace through faith. Yes, by trusting, by the obedience that comes with it, by remaining faithful, by enlarging it throughout the, the, our lives so that we can get to the end of the, our, our life and say, I'm saved because I've kept the faith. As the Apostle Paul said. So, yes, when we, when we give the gospel call of the charisma, as some call it, it is believing. Yes, it is. And that believing should prompt us to confess Jesus Christ as our Lord. It should prompt us to repent, to turn. Repentance is a change of will. You can't not repent. You've got to change your will. And you change that will because you now trust in a Savior. And then we talk about obeying Him in His death in the form of baptism. That is faith. It prompts obedience. You must obey Him in baptism. And so if you're not a Christian this morning, we urge you to come. If you are a Christian and you need the prayers of the saints for any reason, you come home and stand.